Dr. Jane Goodall, thank you very much for being on In Conversation. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Let me greet everybody with the distance greeting of the chimpanzee. That means this is me, this is Jane. Jane Goodall, you are the most extraordinary person and that was a lovely introduction. Who do you like better, chimpanzees or humans? Well, chimpanzees are so like people that I like some chimpanzees better than some people and some people better than some chimpanzees. You've said previously that you think that the disrespect that we humans have shown to animals and nature has created conditions which possibly allows for the easier jump for, of diseases from animals to humans, zoonotic diseases. In other words, ones like COVID-19. But what about people who say that eating animals is completely normal and eating wild animals is completely normal as well? Well, you have to say that throughout history, uh, you know, originally hunter-gatherers, that, that's what they had to do. And I don't know about the, the ethics of it. It depends on how you think about animals. But the problem is that shooting a wild animal in the forest and eating it because you have to is very different from capturing it, trafficking it around the world, selling it in a wildlife market, whether that's in Asia or Africa or Latin America. Um, in these wildlife markets, they're sold as food, as medicine, as clothing, and as pets. And it's not only the wildlife markets that create these conditions where it really, it's not perhaps, definitely, in these conditions, it is possible for a pathogen like a virus, like the coronavirus that led to COVID-19, to jump from one animal to one person, where it may form a new disease. In fact, 75% of all known newly emerging human diseases are from animals. But it's not just the wildlife markets and the pets. It's also the factory farms where billions of domestic animals are crammed together in equally cruel and unhygienic conditions. And there too, some of these zoonotic diseases have started. And when we think on top of all that, that every single one of those animals is a sentient being with a personality, with a mind, with an ability to feel fear and pain, then you can see how our disrespect of animals is disturbing in so many ways. How do we counter that then? When somebody says, no, I need to eat the bile of uh, a particular uh, bear because it will make me better. It will cure my cancer or something else. How do you convince well, that person the, that's not true? It's not true. The problem is that uh, some people don't want to believe in the science of these things, but it's, it's proven that not, not only is it unnecessary to eat bare bile because the animal is a suffering being, but there's an alternative to it. It's being sold, it's cheaper than uh, bare bile, and it's safer because the bare bile itself could lead to another disease. I discovered there is a virus in the, in the bare bile that could lead to a new zoonotic disease. So it's much safer to use the synthetic variety and not have to torture animals and risk our own health. I mean, it's like rhino horn. Rhino horn is simply the material that our fingers are made of, fingernails are made of. And it doesn't cure all these things, but people believe that it does. I mean, they're even killing amazing rhinos to cure hangovers. I mean, this is awful. And rhinos are nearly extinct. What do you think that we can do uh, to change all of this? When did you become a vegetarian? Well, I, was, I became a vegetarian when I read Peter Singer's book, Animal Liberation, because I had absolutely no notion of a factory farm. I mean, when I was growing up, animals grazed around in the fields. So there were none of these horrific conditions. And as soon as I read about that and the horrendous cruelty, the next time I looked at a piece of meat on my plate, and this was the late 60s, probably 68 or 69, I thought this piece of meat is symbolic of fear, pain, death. 
who wants to eat fear, pain and death? I didn't. That was the last time I touched meat. What about animal testing, though? Is that ever justified the various vaccines that we are taking right now? Um, and you've also uh, been vaccinated as well, have actually been gone through animal trials. Is it not necessary sometimes to have animal trials and animal testing? Well, it might be now, but I've always said it's not ethically right. So as we've got these amazingly brilliant brains, let's try and find ways that we can do these things without animals. Because let's face it, even chimpanzees, our closest relatives, we share 98.6% of our DNA with them. And yet they turned out not to be a useful model for HIV AIDS at all. They could be infected with it, but they didn't get the same symptoms because chimpanzees and people are different. So now there are amazing alternatives already. And you get these um, organs and other things on a chip. And some of the recent developments in this mean that actually to create a vaccine, it's not needed to use an animal and it's quicker to not to use the animal and safer not to use the animal. But of course, these new inventions and innovations have to pass through the body that certifies them as safe for people. And of course, there's a huge amount of money invested in animal testing, a huge amount of money. And so all the people involved don't want it to stop. But you know, I'm thinking of the thousands of monkeys and using them in this way to create vaccines. If they were treated nicely, but they're not, they're in these tiny little cages. They know nothing but fear. They've been snatched from the wild or at least snatched from their mothers. And it's, we just have to stop behaving like this. And if we feel it's necessary to use an animal, at least for now, then treat the animal kindly and respectfully and give thanks like the indigenous people give thanks to the animal when they kill it to eat it. Some people say that the COVID-19 pandemic has given us a chance um, to do the great reset, that we can go back to uh, a, a point where we don't pollute as much. Do you believe that? Or do you think that this is, this is something that is delusional? We'll go back to our evil ways as soon as, as we all get our vaccines and can travel again. Well, um, first of all, one thing that did happen is that in some places, uh, heavy industry stopped for a while because of lockdown. And some people probably for the first time in their lives, like in the big, big cities, for the first time, they knew clean air. They could look up without looking through smog to see the stars at night. And some people for the first time could hear the bird song around them. So one thing the pandemic has done it's helped us to understand that it's really our fault. We brought it on ourselves to a very large extent because of this disrespect of animals and nature. And so more and more people are thinking post pandemic, it's necessary to have a different relationship with the natural world and a different kind of more sustainable, greener economy. Now, on the other hand, there are political leaders and there are big corporations that just are dying to get back as business to business as usual. And people are no longer thinking, or some of these people, of how does this affect future generations? How does it affect the health of the planet? Dr. Goodall, you make it sound as if all businesses are bad, which is not true. Many businesses employ people 
people of livelihoods have meaning in life because of the things that are created. And the things that are created are not necessarily bad things. They are refrigerators, they are cars, they are uh, hospitals are being built. Not all business is bad business. I didn't say that. Uh, you, you, you misheard me, maybe on purpose. I didn't say that. I said some. Um, but the whole general idea that we can have this development. We have brains. We are already doing things much better. We're using solar power, wind power. We're creating uh, cars that use far less fossil fuel, but creating electric cars and working on better and better batteries. Uh, so we're beginning to use this amazing intellect to try to solve some of these problems. And I have absolute firsthand experience with what you were talking about. When I first began studying chimpanzees in Gombe, the little tiny national park in Tanzania was part of a great forest belt that stretched across Africa. By 1990, that's 30 years later, I flew over and I saw this tiny island of forest that was the national park, bare hills all around. Realized that these people were cutting down the trees in their desperate effort to survive. There were more of them than the land could support, too poor to buy food from elsewhere. And so they were struggling to survive. And this is when it hit me. If we don't find ways, help them to find ways of making a living without destroying the environment, then we can't try to save chimpanzees, forests, or anything else. You've said that young people are going to be the hope uh, for creating better conditions for climate change. Yet, if we look at a lot of young people, they seem to be glued to their mobile devices or their iPads or the technology. So the irony is, in fact, they may be more distant from nature uh, than the previous generations, than you were. Well, um, I started a program for youth, Roots and Shoots, in 1991. And it's spread around to nearly 60 countries. It's got members from kindergarten, lots in university, everything in between, more and more adults taking part. And its main message is every single one of us makes some impact on the planet every single day. And we have a choice as to what sort of impact we make. And for example, what can the ordinary person do? Little choices may seem insignificant. What do I buy? Um, did it harm the environment? Was it cruel to animals? Is it cheap because of child slave labor or sweatshops? If it is, don't buy it unless you're very poor. And then you simply have to do what it takes to stay alive, whether it's cutting down the last trees in a rural area or buying cheap junk food in a city because you've got to do it to survive. So we've got to alleviate poverty. That's terribly important. We've got to reduce the unsustainable lifestyle of the rest of us. So for a young person, that would mean don't buy the next new iPhone? Stick with your old iPhone? That's right. And if you really need a new iPhone, recycle. We have a recycling program in our Jane Goodall Institute in many different countries. But you know, the little choices we make each day may seem insignificant. But if you have hundreds, then thousands, then millions, and ultimately billions of people making ethical choices because you've alleviated poverty and everybody can, and you've improved education and you've encouraged educators and schools to insist that children spend time outside, to get to know and love nature, to grow organic food. It may cost a little more, but if you, if you pay a little bit more, you value the food more and you waste less because the waste of food is horrendous and it causes all kinds of problems like rats multiply and cockroaches multiply and you know all the creatures that come in and make use of our waste which is bad for them and bad for us and spreads disease.
Dr. Goodall, when you started your research, at that time in the 1960s, there were only three billion persons in the world. As you say, there are now over seven billion of us. Is the problem possibly that there are just too many of us? We are the problem. I mean, there's a lot of talk about invasive species. Let's get rid of them. They're killing our native fauna and flora. The worst invasive species ever, ever on this planet is humans. And <laughs> it started with the agricultural revolution. Um, that's when people began settling and left the hunter-gatherer way of life, which was like any other creature, you know, monkeys and things. We weren't harming the environment back then. And then came the Industrial Revolution and things got even worse. So, you know, human beings are amazing. And if we would only use head and heart together, then we could reach our true human potential. If we believed in the science, and one of the problems with believing in science is that scientists tend to be very, you know, they, 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 they depend on statistics and what they're talking about is often sounding as though there's no hope. And if people believe there's no hope, then why bother? You might as well go on doing what you're doing if it's not going to make any difference. When we look, though, at how the rainforest has been damaged and a lot of the things that we're worried about in climate change, we tend to, we tend to blame big business. But there is also the role of all the small farmers, and many of them are slash and burn farmers. We have them here in, in Southeast Asia as well. How are we going to change that, and how are we going to change how they think? What we are promoting and what absolutely works is uh, permaculture and restorative agriculture. And in this way, you don't need to clear new land. You can continue using your land because you use it in such a way that it doesn't run out of fertility. And so the slash and burn, that's failing in many places because there's nowhere left to slash or burn. We don't want slashing or burning, uh, but even that is no worse than industrial agriculture with monocultures and all the pesticides and herbicides that they're spraying onto the land. They're killing the land, they're killing the soil. They're killing the soil. And they're destroying biodiversity with all the pesticides and herbicides. So we were trying to encourage more and more of the permaculture and the restorative agriculture, and it works. And then we can save areas for wildlife to survive. Dr. Goodall, you talk a lot to politicians. Are there any of them that you actually believe when they come up with these climate change promises? Unfortunately, there's an awful lot of evidence out there that some of them just pay lip service to things like this and actually go on carrying on in the same old way. But there are some politicians who are different. The, you know, and, and that's a great thing about Roots and Shoots. It began in 91. So we already have some of those alumni who are up there in politics and in business, and they hang on to the values that they, that they gained. We've got to support politicians when they do have a changed heart. Uh, how do we get to the politician in the first place? Well, I've always reached people's hearts by telling stories. I think telling stories is so much better than providing a whole lot of statistics. And people need to change from within and then they will uphold their commitment if there's enough people supporting them. But you can't expect a politician to carry on honoring his commitment if more than half the population don't want him to because then he'd be out of his job and he won't have accomplished anything. If you were 26 again and were looking for something incredible to do, something wonderful to research, a young scientist, where would you go? What would you do? Is there anything new to discover? Is there anything oh, new to research? There is so much to discover. You know, the research today into animal intelligence is revealing so much that's new, so much that's exciting. And I always tell students, you know, if you are interested in, in animal behavior, animal intelligence is an incredible field, full of opportunities, full of new discoveries waiting to be un unraveled.
And it's, it's really, really the most exciting time for learning new things about animals in my lifetime, new things about the oceans, new tools that enable us to go deep under the ocean, up in the forest canopy. We, we're, we're destroying areas of nature before we even begun to uncover the secrets it holds. If there is one human characteristic that you value most, what would you say it is? I would want to couple respect with compassion, I think. And you know, there's one interesting thing. Every single major religion in the world, every single one has the same golden rule. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Dr. Jane Goodall, thank you very much for talking to us on In Conversation. Well, it's been a very great pleasure and thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share a message of hope. We must have hope.